into it. Okay, so there are two different categories in which we can think about racial profiling um, in U.S. society, probably more than two, but I'm going to touch on just two this, this evening. One is racial profiling that happens at the civilian level, our fellow um, citizens, and then racial profiling that happens at the level of law enforcement. So I'm going to start off with looking at racial profiling at the level of civilians. So recently, some of you or many of you may have heard of the incident with Christian Cooper in Central Park. Um, he um, was in uh, Central Park. If you haven't been, Central Park is massive um, in New York City. And he was in a section um, called the Ramble. Now he's a bird watcher, an avid bird watcher. He's not a novice. He, he does, he's had many years of experience doing this. And within that section, you're supposed to have your dog leashed. So he had, you know, he noticed there was a woman there by the name of Amy Cooper, no relation to him, um, who did not have her dog leashed. And she requested that she would have her dog leashed. And she was really offended by this simple request, even though that was the rules for that particular area of the, um, the park. And this incident quickly escalated. Um, and when it did, he said, let's press record. Um, and we'll kind of get to why, as a Black man, he would feel the need to have this documented, okay? But he presses record, and she begins to say, you know, you can't tell me to do this, and I feel like I'm being threatened, and I'm going to call 911 and tell them there is an African-American man threatening me. And that language is really important. She didn't say a man right? She didn't say a person. She specifically enunciated an African-American man. And then she proceeds to call dispatch. And when she gets on the phone, the inflection in her voice changes, you know, I mean, almost in an Oscar-worthy way. And she begins to sound frightened and threatened. And anyone listening to her on the other end of that line would think that someone was actively harming her. And he has the cell phone. And it's clear that she is some distance away from him. And when they are closer together, it's her who's approaching him rather than the other way around. And this was really, you know, there were memes made about this and some people joked about it, but it was really triggering, quite frankly, for many people in general and for African-Americans um, in particular, and I would say even African-American men in particular, because of the history of this country when it comes to the word of white, Americans versus Black Americans, and even more specific, and I'll, I'll give some examples of white women and Black men and the repercussions that has, that has historically had even to the point of death. And so when we think of um, this incident and the group of incidents, and I'll give a few other examples to, to give you greater context. Um, you know, recently the, the term that's been used to categorize them is, uh, or women like Miss Amy Cooper is Karen. Um, and there has been some controversy over the terminology, but essentially what that means is a woman who is using her privilege and position as a white woman to escalate a situation beyond what's needed um, in a reasonable way. So, you know, going to a restaurant and the waiter brings the wrong drink. Oh, you know, this isn't the drink that I ordered. That would be a reasonable response. The waiter would then go get the right drink and that would be the end of it. This person says, I need to speak to a manager, right? So quickly escalating the situation in a way that's unreasonable um, for, the, for the particular context. And some have used this term, and it's, it's a strong term, but I, I want you to, to track with me here, that when that happens, like what, would hap like what happened to Christian Cooper, that is weaponizing whiteness. That is saying, because I know that I'm a white person in America, my word is automatically going to be believed against your word, even if I'm lying, okay? Because history, honestly, is, is on the side of that, okay? So I'll give you some historical examples, but let me just give you some more contemporary examples. So uh, in 2018, May 2018, there was um, a family barbecuing in um, Oakland, California, Lake Merritt Park in Oakland, California. And um, a woman by the name of Jennifer Schultz, I believe, she tells them, you can't barbecue here. 
and the, the individuals had done this for many years. They're like, no, we, we can barbecue here. So quickly she escalates this by calling law enforcement, right? No one was in danger. No one is being harmed. She's not being forced to stay there and watch people barbecue their meat, but she calls law enforcement. And this was being videotaped and the videotape of that quickly went viral. She became known as quote unquote barbecue Becky, right? Again, intervening in, in, in what would be at a pretty harmless, innocuous situation and escalating it by calling law enforcement. Um, a month late, or sorry, a month earlier, this was in Starbucks, 2018. Some of you may have also heard of this case. You had two young men who went to Starbucks. They were waiting for a friend, two African-American young men who went to Starbucks. They were waiting for a friend who happened to be white. And while they were waiting, they asked if they could use the restroom. The manager said, no, you can't use the restroom. That's against our policy if you're not purchasing anything. And so they said, okay, fine, we're just gonna sit down. So they just sat down waiting for their friend and the manager at Starbucks proceeds to call law enforcement, right? These young men are not arguing. They're not fighting about the fact they can't use the restroom. They just sit down and wait. Um, so law enforcement eventually come and remove the men. And again, they're, they're, for about a week was, you know, a, a boycott Starbucks um, hashtag circulating around um, social media until the CEO of Starbucks issued a statement and, and addressed um, policies um, related to related to that. Um, another example, and this is at the collegiate level, and so I think it's pertinent to um, all of us here, in May of 2018, these have been in pretty rapid succession, if you can't tell, in 2018, um, a young woman at, at Yale University, she was taking a nap on the couch, right? I, I see students napping, you know, sometimes in on the couch in, in my building in Boris. She was napping. Um, another student sees her and rather than saying, um, you know, did you, you know, I, I just approach her in a civil way, calls campus security. And she's a Yale student and she felt like I have the right to be here. And she brought that up to administration and that um, her discussion of that was viral um, as did the other ones. And the last one, and I have more if you all want any other examples, but the last one I'm going to touch on because it's, uh, it happened within the Charlotte area. Um, on the night of October um, 2018, two sisters were living in apartments in, in the South Park area. And if you're not familiar with the South Park area, it's a relatively upscale um, area in, in South Charlotte. And as they're approaching their apartment, this woman um, says, um, are you supposed to be here? And they say, no, this is our apartment. We're just, you know, we're just going home. And she begins to question them about whether or not they should legitimately be there, um, asking to see proof that they belong there. And this is, this is a civilian, like they're a civilian. This is not a law enforcement officer. And as in other cases, there is video footage of this. Um, of what happened. And um, now what happened in this case is a little different from what happened in the other cases. Um, a judge eventually ordered that this, um, this woman um, uh, actively um, had to participate in meetings called, and I had never heard of this until I researched greater details on this case, White People Caucus. Um, I had never heard of this. This is in Charlotte, okay? Um, a group created by organizing against racism that encourages participants to examine and deconstruct internalized racial superiority and develop a deeper awareness of the power of privilege. So this is this was the the sanction from um, from the judge. And she he, she also had to um, have unsupervised probation as well as um, community um, community engagement. So what does this all mean? On one hand, of course, it's embarrassing. It's really inconvenient at the very least for the individuals who are on the receiving end of it. Um, but it's triggering as well. And I believe I, I used that terminology before. So I'm going to share a screen um, kind of as a point of departure here, um, if, I, if I may. This will work. All right. Okay. 
Let's see. Right. So you see this uh, film, it's called Birth of a Nation. If you've never heard of this before, um, I go to YouTube. You don't even have to watch the film. There are enough summaries of it that you get a good idea of what that film is and its historical significance. So after Reconstruction, that is after, um, or I guess a little bit, somewhat during, but we'll call this after during Reconstruction. So slavery ends, we have the period of Reconstruction um, in which two African-American men um, become part of the United States Senate and, and other African-Americans become a part of, con of um, the House of Representatives. There becomes this intentional push to scale back the rights of African Americans. And this film, um, Birth of a Nation, is one of those situations where life imitates art. Usually it's art imitating life. Um, the significance of this film is such that um, life begins to imitate art. So there's a lot in this film, but what I'll focus on is there's this narrative of Black men being dangerous to white women. And the idea was that if we give African Americans more rights, more privileges, like the ability to, you know, be elected officials, there are going to be these huge repercussions. So, you know, in that um, film, for example, that's when we see the first image of crosses being burned by the Ku Klux Klan, right? The, the actual Ku Klux Klan looked at the film and said, oh yeah, that's, that's a good idea. I like what I see there. Let's actually do this to terrorize African Americans. Um, and so the, the pervasive theme throughout the film of this white woman running away from black men creates in the minds of moviegoers, this was a 1915 silent film, it creates in their mind that black masculinity is, is a thing to be feared, it's dangerous, and in order to prevent that, we don't need to rely on formal justice, although the justice system at that time you know, uh, was obviously not in favor of African Americans, but we don't even need to rely on that. We can take justice into our own hands. And so what that means is that the word of a white person without any evidence could mean death for um, African Americans and for African American males in particular. Um, we see this with examples like Emmett Till, the 14 year old who is visiting family in Mississippi, and, you know, based on the word of a white woman who eventually says that she was lying many, many years later, um, he whistled at her. And so what happened, he was lynched, right? If you are not familiar with Emmett Till, I really um, encourage you to, um, to, to spend a few moments reading up on his story after this. Um, we see this with Rosewood, the massacre in Rosewood, Florida. You have the accusation that um, an African American um, attacked a white woman, and just based on that accusation, an entire town is burnt to the ground, and many African American um, African Americans um, residents in that town were were killed. Um, so the false accusations historically of um, of African Americans by white Americans have meant death. All right. So now let's, uh, let me kind of end this screen share here. Um, okay, now let's draw a connection to law enforcement. And like I said, I'll, I'll make a connection to between the two. Um, black residents, and now we're gonna talk about racial profiling at the level of law enforcement. Black residents are more likely to be stopped um, by police than white or Hispanic residents both when it comes to traffic stops as well as when it comes to street stops, okay? Black and Hispanic residents were also more likely to have multiple contacts. One in six um, Black residents who were pulled over in a traffic stop or stopped in the street had similar interactions with law enforcement over the course of that year. So it's not just that within their lifetime, they're more likely to have these um, unprovoked interactions, it's, they're more likely to have them happen repeatedly over and over again. Again, you know, if you're stopped and, often, and you have this interaction, you go home, 
you have to keep in mind, it's not that that interaction ends, right? This is an indignity, right? Having to be stopped for doing nothing, um, for um, not, you know, having committed a crime, because at least within states like New York and New Jersey, you know, they kind of audited this data to see what percentage of individuals who were stopped actually committed a crime. And it is alarmingly low, right? So it's not like officers are engaging in these stop and frisk interactions or traffic stop, pretext traffic stops, and, um, you know, they're apprehending people who committed crimes. That's just not happening. So people are being stopped essentially for, for no reason at all. Um, when police initiated an interaction, um, they were twice as likely to threaten or use force against Black and Hispanic residents than white residents. And that brings us to George Floyd, um, right? That brings us to um, other high profile instances in which that interaction doesn't just happen, but it's deadly. So if Amy Cooper had called law enforcement, which she did, had law enforcement come, and both of them still been there, would law enforcement been more likely to believe Christian Cooper or her without video footage of that interaction? And history tells us time and time again that it would have been her word against his, and his word may not have counted for a lot, right? And I will add, um, you know, I'll, because people discuss this, he had quote unquote pedigree, right? He was a Harvard graduate, he'd worked for prestigious companies. But even with that pedigree, right, him being Black historically would have placed him at a disadvantage. And so I want to um, quickly just give you some visuals um, to put into context. Um, the, um, the interactions between civilians and law enforcement. All right. So, Okay, so you can see that, um, like I said, law enforcement are more likely, to, law enforcement is more likely to use force against people of color. So we can see some comparisons there where African Americans compared to um, their Hispanic and white counterparts. Okay, now I'm going to show you all another slide. Um, when asked, have you have personal or have your personal experiences with police been mostly good? or mostly bad or mixed, you can see a difference between those two responses, looking at that green circle compared to that red circle. Um, African-Americans are more likely to say they've not had great experiences or, right, they've not had great experiences and more likely, are less likely to say that they've had good experiences. And so, you know, if you ask someone, what is their opinion of law enforcement? Well, if you're in a community where a lot of these experiences are negative, you're less likely to, um, to say that you have a positive view of, of law enforcement, okay? Uh, let's see here, all right. Have you ever warned your children to be careful when dealing with the police? Um, so this is you know, more of a qualitative question. How do you feel about police and how does that feeling then um, impact something as intimate as child's rearing. And you can see that 74% of African-Americans have had that conversation with their children, right? It's called the talk um, within the African-American community. All right, and then um, I'm gonna end here, all right? So I'm gonna show you this picture and then I'll kind of close the screen. Um, so some of you may have heard of this name, many of you may have not. Um, but George Stinney Jr. is the reason why weaponizing privilege, weaponizing whiteness um, to the extent that it causes undue harm to an innocent person because of their race has deadly repercussions and deadly consequences. George Stinney Jr. is the youngest American to be executed in the United States of America. He was 14 years old. Um, to um, little white girls were brutally murdered um, in South Carolina. And someone said, no evidence, someone said they saw him cross paths with them. And because of that, he was apprehended. His parents were not allowed to be with him. He had, didn't have legal representation. 
Um, the trial lasted, if I'm not mistaken, three days. And the jury decided within one hour of all white men that he was guilty. And I think around three months later, he was executed. He was so small that in order for him while seated on the executioner chair, for his head to reach the metal bowl through which 24,000, I believe, volts of electricity would run through his body, they had, he had to sit on um, telephone books, okay? Um, in 2014, the state of South Carolina exonerated George Stinney because they realized that the weapon used, this, this four by four um, used to kill these girls would be impossible for someone of his stature to be able to even lift. And so when we think about racial profiling, both at the civilian level, we think about it when it comes to law enforcement, the consequences are deadly. It's not just, and I say just because that in and of itself is a problematic, having, it, having an embarrassing interaction, it can unfortunately lead to dangerous repercussions. It, it, historically, you know, Amy Coopers have led to Derek Chauvin's, right? Um, have led to deaths of innocent Black men. And so I will stop there um, and let our other um, discuss and share their perspectives. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Patterson. Hi, my name is Tara Patterson. I proudly serve as the president of the iconic Taukai chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated at Wingate University. I wanna take a moment to thank you all for providing me with the space and time to speak briefly on the impact of race relations in my life. Racial profiling is dangerous, and is especially so in the arena of healthcare. I'd like to take the time to discuss the effects of racial profiling on my education. Through primary school and into secondary education, I excelled academically. I thrived in my education and was admitted into schools because of my academic inclination. Everybody has their, their personal hiccups though, mine being oral language. I struggle with pronouncing certain sounds like the TH blend, the. I was directed to the nearby hospital for a speech evaluation. The speech pathologist there determined that I suffered no medical complications. This struck my parents as odd as no tests were completed. Furthermore, she told my parents that what they were hearing was AAVE or African American Vernacular English. My parents were in disbelief as no one in our household used AAVE as my parents believed it would be a disadvantage for their children when we entered the real world. So they had a second evaluation completed. The second evaluation revealed that I did suffer from a medical condition. This medical condition wouldn't allow me to hear certain sounds. It was almost as if someone was speaking very closely into a microphone. I was in need of an operation as I was unable to hear. After the operation, there was a tremendous difference in my fluency. This is a plain example of racial profiling in healthcare that could have led to deafness in my own situation. Without swift action by my parents, it is likely that I will be unable to hear and communicate in this manner with you all today. I would like you to leave you with this. Swift, intentional action was a necessity in my life to preserve my sense of hearing. I challenge you all today to do this. In your environment, take swift, intentional action to enact change against racial profiling. My name is Taylor Patterson. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Taylor. Um, Dr. Mitchell, Yes, thank you, Antonio. Uh, thank you again for inviting me to this conversation. Um, always a pleasure to interact with uh, Wingate and Dr. Monday is always uh, a good segue into the conversation. So thank you for all of that information. Um, as I thought about what I would share with you today, um, my mind started running in several different directions. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about in terms of how we talk about bias. Um, you know, we always talk about and we're always willing to challenge uh, explicit bias, the things that we know just are blatantly wrong, you know, things that we should, shouldn't do. Um, but we, we really have a tough time. And when I say we, I mean Black, White, Asian, Hispanic, Native American, um, heterosexual, homosexual, just across the board, we really have a difficult time really addressing our implicit bias. 
And I want to be clear that we all, regardless of race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, we all carry implicit bias. Um, and I, I want us to think about how do we challenge each other to have those, as talked about on the other call, uncomfortable conversations. Because you really can't start to address implicit bias or unconscious bias until we start to have uncomfortable conversations, until we, until we really start to look at what are the things that I'm carrying as an individual that impact how I look at other people, how I interact with other people, what I assume about other people. Uh, Dr. Mundy gave some uh, great statistics earlier and it triggered my memory. My son is learning how to drive and we were driving um, around the other day uh, throughout Charlotte and um, part of Union County and, and just driving and the thought occurred to me, I, I told him, you know, when you start driving, um, especially if you're alone in the car and I'm not here or your dad's not here, I want you to start taking your wallet out before you start the car. I want you to put your wallet on, we have a little ledge on the dash, I want you to put your wallet there so if you ever get stopped by the police, you can keep your hands in a position where they're seen at all times so that there's no confusion on whether or not you're reaching for something, a weapon or anything like that. And I would, I would challenge those of you with children um, to think about whether or not you have had to have that conversation with your child. Is that something that even comes to mind that needs to be discussed? So when she presented the statistics about those conversations that we have and this discrepancies across uh, racial and ethnic uh, identities, those are real experiences that we're having. And it is very real for me as a mother of two young black men to have that conversation with him to protect his life. These aren't things, uh, conversations that individuals are having, you know, just based on assumptions or, or um, you know, things that we've seen on TV. There are things that we are experiencing in our day-to-day -day life that cause us to have to have these conversations um, and to, to get our children to think about others' implicit bias against them. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is, um, is you know, when we think about um, implicit bias, you, you think about things that run contrary to what your stated beliefs are. So you may say that, you know, I, I see all people, I love all people, I don't judge people on the basis of race, yet you may be, you know, walking down the street and see um, an African-American male coming and suddenly get a little nervous. Is he going to snatch my purse? Is he going to try to attack me? Is something going to happen? And those are the things that we want to talk about. So while we like to think of ourselves as as good people, as people who, um, who are nurturing and caring um, to other people, we all carry those um, stereotypes. Um, about other individuals who don't look like us, who don't have the same socialization as uh, we do. Um, I used to work at the University of Michigan and we have a program there called the Intergroup Relations Program, or the Program on Intergroup Relations. And I pulled some information from there that I think is really important um, when talking about interrupting bias. They talk about what's called the PALS approach. Uh, P-A-L-S, and you can find this information uh, if you go to the um, igr.umich.edu. It's the Intergroup Relations uh, Project at the University of Michigan, if you want to Google that. But they talk about how to interrupt bias. And the thing that I want to challenge everyone to do is to think about this approach. And I've used this approach, and quite Honestly, I've failed to use this approach sometimes because sometimes um, our personal bias or our uncomfortableness in a situation where um, bias has occurred doesn't always allow us to move um, to move with with courage. 
Um, and I can, I can be the first to admit that uh, while I try to always challenge things and, and always be outspoken, sometimes things take you by surprise and you don't have that, uh, that courage at the moment to talk about that. But I want to talk to you about the PALS approach. The first thing that they talk about is to pause, to interrupt the flow of conversation and let the speaker know that you are interested in learning more about something that they just said. So if you hear something that doesn't quite sound right, whether it's a stereotype about your individual group or another group that you may not identify with, but you know is wrong, you want to, you know, you want to say, you know, well, let's wait a second. Can you, can you explain that a little bit more? And that moves into the A, to ask and acknowledge what the person is saying. You know, you want to say, you know, that, that sounds important. I, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Or I think I heard you say X, Y, and Z. Is this, is this what you're saying? To just get that clarification um, on what they're saying. And then L, you want to listen. Listen and treat them with dignity. But you also want to be um, genuine in your curiosity. You want to be a generous listener. Um, and be open and uh, be open to share your own inner voice um, and to try to truly understand where the other person is coming from and to listen harder, especially if you disagree. Sometimes our instinct is to jump right in and, uh, and contradict what the other person is saying. But sometimes when we're having courageous conversations, you have to step back a little bit and listen to what the person is saying. Try to get them to talk a little bit more and understand where this is coming from, how it's evolved. And then last is to, is the S, is to speak your truth and to share your stories. So there's power in storytelling. So if you are going to share factual data like Dr. Mundy did earlier, that's helpful. Um, but we also want to, to tell people what our experiences are. So if there's a stereotype um, in the classroom, if you're a faculty member and you're, you're in the, the faculty lounge and the you know, there's people are talking about, you know, well, you know, black students come here and they just, they just can't write, you know, it's just, their writing is just absolutely horrible. And, you know, I don't know how to get them here. Share your stories about that student who had excellent writing skills. Try to break those stereotypes down so that they don't become generalizations that prohibit individuals from treating each individual as just that, an individual with their own experiences, with their own skills um, and things of that nature. So I really wanna push you as faculty, as staff, as peers, students, when you're in the residence halls, when you're interacting in the classroom, uh, when you're in the cafeteria or wherever you may be interacting with your peers, be open to having those conversations and be open to connecting with individuals so that you can start to break down some of the, the assumptions that you have um, about groups that are not like your own. And, and I say that to both um, you know, our, our black students, our white students, our Latino students, the Asian students, um, LGBT, everyone, everyone needs to start engaging in conversations that help to, uh, to, to expand our ideas on what um, other people are like. Um, so I'll stop there because um, I got a whole page of notes here, <laughs> but I'll stop there um, and allow our next speaker and I look forward to interacting um, more with you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, Dr. Davis. Look, I, I'm just, just blessed to be in the space because I'm learning so much, taking notes, and it's just always an honor to glean from other folks, man. Um, I, I'm just filled up. But let me just say that uh, there were so many things that, that were shared that um, are coming to mind for me. Uh, first, uh, the conversation about caucuses, right? Uh, please use that as a resource. Um, for those of you that are not familiar, it was Organizing Against Racism. Uh, this is um, an onset of the Racial Equity Institute. Uh, founder Dina Green, uh, Racial Equity Institute. They're out of Greensboro, North Carolina. They facilitate uh, something that is copyrighted called the Groundwater. Um, conversation uh, that is their, um, you know, construct, if you will. Uh, they have 
those sessions that they are offering. Uh, the last time I checked online, they are ha they're having those sessions um, in the web-based environment. Uh, but they have two-day sessions as well, um, where you come in and you spend a, a full two days uh, discussing uh, issues of race. And so I, I would suggest and offer uh, that you take advantage of that. Um, I was excited to hear that story, Dr. Vonde, because I know that they've been doing a lot of work with Mecklenburg County, uh, and they've been working with uh, government, you know, city governments across North Carolina and across the United States. So that's encouraging uh, to hear that people are allowing what they're learning to show up, you know, in the decision-making processes. And when we talked uh, last week about systems and systemic change, we know that that's that's where it starts. We have to have individuals with that privilege and power uh, take those necessary steps to do that. Birth of a nation, man. You know, when you when you brought the birth of a nation, I thought I was having flashbacks to high school. Um, this phenomenal history instructor, Vivian Moore, one of my favorite teachers, a redhead white lady, y'all. I mean, she was on fire, boy. That lady was off the chain. I love me some Vivian Moore. We stay in contact to this day. Uh, and she is just uh, a mentor uh, to me. Uh, Vivian Moore actually showed us the film Birth of a Nation when I was in high school. And, you know, she, we, we had conversation about it. And I remember there was this one student that talked about this scene where we see um, a man in blackface who uh, comes up out of the bush, you know what I'm saying, and uh, is getting ready to attack this white lady. And she's like, ah! And they compared it to footage from a King Kong movie, one of the original King Kong movies. It's almost identical. And uh, so seeing that just put me back at Hugh M. Cummings High School in Burlington, North Carolina. And um, I just, I, I was so grateful for that conversation at that uh, time in my life. You know, thinking about bias, I can't help but think about my own uh, experiences. There was a study conducted uh, back in 2016 at Yale that looked at biases as early as preschool. And long and short of the study is that they identified that in that teachers, uh, white teachers, uh, teachers who may have been black or Hispanic, often uh, saw the African American male students as being the problem student. When you look at this study, it was all about uh, bias. Um, they even used uh, something that we talked about in corporate America uh, when we redact the names of uh, potential candidates that are interviewing for jobs and we give uh, the information to uh, interview committees. And because they can't see the name and they just see the experience, they may assume that this particular person is a particular, of a particular race or demographic. Uh, and then they reveal the names and it's like, oh, I didn't realize that, right? Well, they did the same thing in this study uh, where they gave a description of a student, of a child to instructors, to teachers, preschool teachers. And they looked at things like single parent. You know, these were some descriptors. A uh, parent has to work two jobs, single mom. Uh, they live in a poor neighborhood. Um, you know, the students struggle sometimes with math. And each individual that read this description automatically said that it must be an African-American male student. And it was not. It was a white female student that they were describing. And so biases show up um, as early as uh, preschool and even beyond preschool, right? I remember at Smith Elementary School in Burlington, North Carolina, um, I was in the kindergarten class, four years old. I started school early based on my birthday. And there were these letters of the alphabet that were on the floor. And I'd been in school about two weeks. And the letters were placed um, across the floor. And it, it caused you to sort of jump on them, right? And so I was jumping and I was saying A and B and I was reading the words. And I had a teacher that stopped me and uh, told me that I wasn't going to get um, you know, whatever they were giving at the time. I don't know if it was a red light, uh, green light, yellow light, but whatever it was, I wasn't going to get the green 
uh, because I was jumping and running in class. And so I came home and I told my mom, um, if, I, mean, I wasn't a crier as a kid, you know, I was, you know, like that didn't make sense to me. So I want to ask why I asked a lot of questions. So I didn't cry about it. I wasn't mad about it. I just wanted to know why it happened. And so my mom said, well, what happened? And I explained to her. And so she went to school the next day. And she had a conversation with this teacher who happened to be a white female. And the teacher tried to explain, her name was Miss Woody, uh, tried to explain what happened. And my mom said, can you show me the area that she was jumping? And so she took you know, us over to the area. And she said, well, if you don't want them to put their feet on the feet that are on the floor with the alphabets, why'd you put them on the floor? Because it implies that you're supposed to jump to them, right? You're supposed to step on them in order to learn the alphabets. Fast forward to the middle of the school year. They were testing for gifted and talented students. I wasn't tested. Uh, one of the um, aides who was a part of this class, she went from, uh, I think, about two or three different classes, um, happened to call my mom, African-American female, and said, my mother's name was Birdia, and they called her Birdie. Uh, Birdia is a German name, but my mom's not German. Uh, so she said, Birdie. They're testing for gifted and talented. I think Angie should be tested. And she said, well, nobody from the school called. And so my mom, you know, in the way that she was, she marched to the school when she took me the next day and she asked questions. And what she realized is that some of what uh, these, you know, teachers were saying was this energy that, you know, Angela's doing all this extra stuff, you know, she's not paying attention, really was because I was bored and I was actually already on a second grade level. And so I tested and I was moved into gifted and talented. Um, the first person of color to be in my particular group to be moved into that program uh, at that time in the early 70s. So, you know, last I, I would just share when we talk about bias and how it shows up, I'm gonna fast forward um, to Two quick stories. Uh, one is related to what Dr. Mitchell shared about the conversation and driving. On my way to work to Durham Tech, I noticed that there's a potential roadblock that's being set up. I get to work, uh, which is not that far from, from our house, and I had to call back to my husband uh, and to my son to say, hey, when you leave out, just wanted to let you know that uh, it looks like there may be a roadblock. Why did I do that? Uh, well, my husband drives a Mercedes with tinted windows. He's a pastor uh, and a chaplain uh, who happens to have those uh, decals on his vehicle for that purpose. Uh, but suppose they don't pay attention to that and stop uh, to ask a question. And so I wanted to make sure that when they left out uh, that day that they were mindful of that. Uh, no speeding tickets, ha don't have an issue with that, but just the mere fact uh, that we have that type of vehicle and they are not just black men, but they some big black men. Okay. Um, I just didn't want these six, three, 300 plus uh, pound brothers uh, to be pulled over and have a situation on our hands. Uh, recently was in a conversation with an instructor. I received a grievance from a student. Uh, this happened right before uh, COVID-19. This student's grievance basically said this. Um, today, the police was called on me. Campus police was called on me. I remained um, behind in class to ask for some assistance from my instructor with my math course. On the board, the instructor said, if you needed tutoring, to please stay behind because that was the hour uh, break that they had for office hours and they would assist students. So I waited. Um, after about 10 minutes, the instructor did not acknowledge me. And so I said, Mrs. Such and Such, um, I wanted to check in with you because I needed some help with math. I was standing at this point, walking toward uh, the instructor who was sitting. And the instructor asked, well, could you please sit back down because you're scaring me. 
And so the student said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand how I scared you. Well, it's just because you're tall and you're, you're towering over me and that just makes me feel uneasy. Before the student could say another word, the instructor jumped up, ran out of the classroom and called campus police uh, and said that they were intimidated by this African-American male student uh, who seemed to be threatening me. Now, later when I talked to the instructor, I found out that they had some prior lived experiences that caused some additional anxiety, but the instructor really couldn't explain anything different about the interaction between she and the student. She said the exact same thing that the student said, but just immediately became intimidated because it was the big black man in the room. This impacted the student's entire college career. You know, here's someone who came back to school uh, to retool, uh, wanted to participate in the two-year uh, transfer program to transfer to North Carolina Central to participate in the law program. And because of that, they transferred to another community college uh, to finish out their two-year transfer program uh, because of just that experience of bias. And so I would offer, uh, do, do some research. You know, we talked about self-reflection and the importance of it. Um, self-reflect, there's a couple of books, Biased, this is the cover, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice that Shapes What We See, Do, and Think. This is Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt. So this is a great uh, resource. Blind Spot is another one. Um, of course, the authors, Benaji and Greenwald, um, are two of the doctors that are responsible for Project Implicit. If you're not familiar with Project Implicit, please uh, log on and take some of those assessments on bias. And then finally, these are gonna be hard to pick up because Dr. Kendi uh, right now is in high demand, especially after being on Oprah last night, y'all. I mean, that just, you know, uh, his books are, are out of print. But stamp from the beginning. Uh, some of the same information you heard from Dr. Mondi is here. They've got a remixed version that is not this thick for those of you that are intimidated by the thick books. I'm just saying 37 chapters here, people. Um, if you don't want to read the thick book, then get the remix version. It's just as phenomenal, uh, but it condenses uh, the information a little bit as well. And so I, I hope that uh, some of these uh, stories, uh, and, and we heard Dr. Mitchell talk about the importance of those stories uh, and those lived experiences that I've shared, as well as some of these tools uh, will, be help, will help you become more aware of your own biases. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Davis. All right, so now I wanna open it up to um, any of our participants that want to share anything on racial profiling or um, unconscious bias or uh, anything about you know racial injustice in, in general. Uh, what we're gonna do is just put your name in the chat and then I'll call on you and then you can um, unmute yourself. So anyone that is looking. Any takers? Uh, Zini? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, for me, what I've experienced in education, my mom's a teacher, but when I was in the first grade, I'm from South Africa. And so I went to a school in the Middle East and my teacher was um, a white woman from Britain. And so for the first few months of me being in class, I didn't have any like actual homework. My mom was like, what do you do in class? And I was like, oh, I just color. So she asked the teacher, why does, why does she not do any work? She said, I didn't think she spoke English. And so from there, um, Actually at Wingate, I was having a similar conversation with another student and a professor, I don't know who it was, looked at me and said, you speak very good American English. And I don't know what brought that on, but it's just like, I don't think it was from a place of bad 
thoughts, but it was just, oh, now I have to prove myself over and over again that I am, you know, I speak good English. My mom's an English teacher. I don't really have a choice. So it's like every time I do good, it's like I have to prove myself over and over to every person. So that's just my experience. Thank you. Do the any more I speak want to follow up on on that? Um, yeah, before if we I go on. If I can jump in, um, I mean, Zini, that's a perfect example of unconscious bias, where this, the assumptions about you being um, a Black South African, not being able to speak English, or um, not being able to speak American English. When I first started working at Johnson C. Smith University, I went and did a presentation in a communications class with one of the white professors. Um, and after that um, presentation, he said, you're so articulate. Well, did you expect me not to be? So, so there are assumptions that people carry. Um, and that, I don't want you, you know, you, you talked about at the end, um, you know, and I don't want you to take on the responsibility of having to prove that to other people. Those biases are not yours to carry, that's theirs to carry, but having those courageous conversations again uh, would definitely uh, you know, help with the situation. And you'll find some people who are open to those conversations um, and you'll, you'll find some people who are, who are closed off. And it's, it's not your fight to change what people um, think, but to, to also be, um, be open to sharing uh, your feelings about what they say. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Norwood. Dr. Dawn. Hey there. Hey, um, hey. Here. Sorry, I'm struggling with the colicky <laughs> three month old right now. So if he starts to cry a little bit, my apologies, but I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Um, first, I, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone who spoke um, on this panel. I mean, the information that you all are bringing is just so phenomenal and it's, it's so needed. Um, and of course, I second everything uh, that was said, but also just wanted to reiterate, especially for um, my white faculty members, colleagues, and even students that are on the call um, tonight. You know, again, when we talk about implicit bias, um, one thing I want everybody, want you all to know is that it's not a situation where yeah, baby. It's not a situation where uh, Black folk are saying you're bad people because you have this bias. I think that's a misconception that is had a lot of times when we begin to have these conversations around bias, race, and stereotypes. Um, but it does mean that you have to really be honest with yourself and take a step back and examine your own stereotypes that you have. And, and let me also point out too that stereotypes are a normal part of our culture. Um, there's a small amount of truth to a lot of stereotypes. The problem is when you make, is when you make sweeping judgments about a group of people based on a stereotype before you actually get to interact and know what this individual uh, person is about. That's where we run into trouble. I also wanna bring up too that, um, since this is an academic forum, you know, in academe, it's also really difficult for us as black professors to do the work that we do. And I don't know if, you know, people realize this, um, and particularly my white colleagues. So it's, I just want to just bring this to your attention. As difficult as, say, as stressful as a school year might be for you, um, it is 10 times sometimes more stressful for us because of the added stress that we go through day in, day out when we enter a classroom, even with my PhD from the University of Tennessee, even with Dr. Monday's PhD from Cornell, I think it is, um, and our credentials. Because when we go into a classroom 
And especially for she and I who teach on race, hers is societal and mine's is as it relates to sport. Immediately we get these looks as if, who are you to be telling us this stuff? So I've even gotten situations where I walk into a class and some the the, the students, white students I'm, I'm speaking in particular, don't even know that I'm the professor. They, I have people ask me, who, te who is teaching this class? Do you know anything about, <laughs> do you know anything about her? And I say, well, I think she's a pretty cool chick. I mean, you know, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. But the fact is, we, it's almost like we have to do extra work just to teach the curriculum, whereas a white professor could pick up the same curriculum and go in and teach it, and then it's taken for gospel. That is freaking exhausting. And even amongst our colleagues sometimes, it's, I often wonder, what are these people thinking? What do they think when they see me? It's not that I necessarily care or that it's going to alter the quality of my life. But there have been interactions that I have had, and let's be, I'm just gonna speak truth here, people. There have been interactions where I have been at Wingate and I'm like, did I just walk back on the set of roots? What just happened? There's, I, and when we're talking about historical perspectives, and again, Dr. Monde is just so on point with her historical information she has bought twice or no, three times, I've had a colleague, and honestly, I don't even know his, his name. He might be emeritus status, I'm not sure, but much older. But this man, every time he walked, he has walked past my office a few times. When he greets me, he says, hey, gal. Now, everybody that's Black, especially professors on this call, knows what the historical underpinnings of you as an older white male calling a black female gal means. And it's just, and it just rolls off like it's nothing. And then it, me as the per black person has to sit there and say, hmm, now do I fight this battle? Is it worth fighting? Is it worth bringing up? you know, do I let him know that I am Dr. Such and Such from the University of Tennessee? And doesn't he see my degree on the wall? That's what I go through when I'm sitting in my office. Whereas my other white colleagues, they may go through, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. I don't even want to come to work today, but let me teach my class and then I'll go home and do X, Y, Z. And the fact that and I will, I'll get off of here soon. I'm sorry, Antonio, but I'm so fired up. Time. But the fact that we, as a university, as an institution, continue to not move full steam ahead with making diversity a pr top priority at our institution in terms of results that are going to be mainstays a part that are a part of the strategic development and goals of the institution are concerning to me you have faculty of color here who this stuff that ha that's happening with george floyd and brianna taylor this stuff affects us and then you want us to show up at your institution and be 110%, but you provide no resources for what if one day I'm just not feeling it? Because when I look at George Floyd, I look at my son and I think, what, God, please never let me have to have this conversation with my son, but that's not a reality. I'm gonna have to have this conversation with my son. He's only three and a half months, but the way that this world is and the, what history has taught us, the conversation is gonna have to be had. And again, and this, this, this is the last thing when we talk about profiling. My brother, I'm from Chicago originally. My family still lives there. I have twin brothers who are 35 years old. And between the two of them, they've been stopped a number of times for, by the police for crazy things. The last time my brother got stopped, he happened to be on the phone with my mom. And I was just talking to my mom yesterday about this. And she said that her heart felt like it was gonna jump out of her chest 
because she was so afraid that something was going to happen to him. So she said, stay on the phone with me, son, and just do whatever they tell you to say and don't say a word back. And when he stopped, my brother started to question, well, why are you stopping me? What, why do I have to get out the car? She had to literally yell at him to say, shut up, shut up, don't say a word. They took him out the car, they searched him, they looked through the car, they still, they go run his license. Still, we don't know why they stopped him. And finally, they come back and say, sir, uh, just want to let you know, in the state of Illinois, it's illegal to have a pine cone hanging from your rearview mirror. Make sure you take that off. Again, if that, if my brother had been white, would they really have done all of that? I doubt it. But again, this is the world that we are living in. And I just challenge everybody to, you know, really search deep and try to be part of the change, um, try to be part of the solution. Because if you're not, then you're kind of part of the problem, honestly. And my son has been magnificent for this whole five minutes that I've ranted. So I think I'm going to stop right now. I'm so sorry to take up the too much time. No, no problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Noah. Thank you so much. Um You muted yourself, Antonio. Oh, sorry. Dr. April Smith? To be on this call um, to listen, um, and it's helping me to just reflect on different things that I've experienced. But I am not here to share a story. Um, there's a story that I was thinking of that was I actually put in my dissertation um, last year in regards to making it um, where I was told at one point um, I was in it was I was in a different program for my master's degree um, excuse, excuse me a program for undergrad for speech pathology originally and I remember uh, I had an advisor who shared with me in a very ugly way that I didn't need to be in that particular field um, and it was a very, it was a dia it was a dialogue between us that wasn't um, the best. Um, she was a, a white woman who, from the conversation she had me, with me was very different from the conversation she had with other students in our program. Um, I'm fairly vocal and so I shared that with her and then there were lots of apologies that came by that. But I think, it, when I think back on that, um, at the time, I processed it differently than how I look at it now. Um, and although I did not go uh, complete in speech pathology, I knew my calling was more in higher education to work with uh, a different group of a different population. So I say that to say that kind of going into, we've been talking about implicit biases. And one of the things that I read recently, um, and maybe you all know the late uh, Joan Olson, and she talks about, um, privileges and racism, um, detouring, detour spotting. Um, and so I posted in the group um, a resource that I think would be great for individuals to read um, about, it comes from, it's about, it's a racial equity tool that is very helpful um, and a quick tool for the things that we don't think is racism or the things that are um, biases that we don't really recognize. So I, if you would like to, I posted it there. It's a great resource to read through. Um, it's something that I'm also adding into the library within my, my office and uh, community standards. Um, so because I know we're in, we're in a time where our office is already starting to get a lot of um, messages regarding what has happened. Um, and I appreciate it and because people are speaking out. And I know as time goes on, we'll hear more because it's election time and there will be a lot of things that are gonna be stated. Um, things that I have, I have to remember, I know who I am as, as a human being personally, 
um, and then my role as a professional and trying to bridge the gap there. It's challenging as a black woman um, in the area that I work, but I'm gonna do it and I'm going to make sure that our students are heard um, and that whatever, whoever is at Wingate University um, that wants to rock with me as a, as a whole, and I think many of you are on this call want to do that, we're, we're gonna make it happen to making, making sure that um, we provide equal opportunities for our students. Um, that's a challenge in so many areas, but I just wanna make sure that um, I state that. And for the students that are on this call, know that I, some of you received an email from me already, but know that I'm here to, you know, be an advocate. And so that's all. Thank you. All right, thank you. So next we have um, Ms. Laredo and then Delisha after that. Hi guys. Um, so I actually really appreciate what you just said because that kind of goes with what I have in my own experience. Um, so earlier when Dr. Davis was actually mentioning um, the gifted program at her elementary school, it brought back an experience um, that has really stuck with me. Um, and it happened to me when I was in middle school. Um, so we also had a gifted program. And one day I was pulled out of my class by one of the coordinators from the program. Um, and he talked to me and he mentioned to me that the district administrators were urging him to expand the program to add more diversity to it. Um, so basically, he just wanted me to completely switch my schedule so that I could take all these classes, so I could be in the program. Um, and instead of feeling honored, um, I didn't know really how to feel because I felt like, or I questioned why wasn't I tested when all of the other students were tested, you know? Why was I overlooked um, and only asked to be in the program once, you know, people higher up started asking questions about why is it no more diversity in the program? Um, and so, especially because I um, am an immigrant, I, oh, sorry guys, this is just bringing back memories. Um, my first language is not English. Um, and so I feel like growing up, I had to prove myself to teachers that I um, was like actually a good student. Um, and I felt like I was overlooked in a lot of situations. So I feel like a lot of students of color and especially um, students who, first language is not English, English are uh, very overlooked and not offered the same opportunities that their white counterparts get offered. And so I think that these biases in the education system need to start being addressed, um, especially within the faculty and, um, and the teachers. So I just really appreciate all the faculty that is here today um, because that just shows that you guys are willing to learn and um, identify your own biases so that students like me um, that look like me and other students from different um, communities get to feel like they're going to be looked at and offered the same opportunities. So that's my, my experience. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you so much. Um, Delisha? Hello, everyone. Thank you guys for being here and providing this platform for students to come and talk. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, my transition from being a student to actually being a staff member. Um, I feel like we've had these conversations so many times and quite honestly, I'm a little tired. <laughs> I feel like we have these conversations over and over and over again and we lose the fire. We've been talking about doing training for forever and ever and when have we been trained? When have other faculty members been trained? I don't know if I can speak for students now because I'm no longer a student, but I felt like, you know, if you know who I was during undergrad, my partner in crime is no longer here, Janae Davis. Um, I feel like we fought so hard for a lot of different things and I just don't see a lot of change going on. It's really complicit to me to look around. I feel like every time something terrible happens is when we come together like this. And I, I love the unity, but it's, it always dies out. It never continues to go. We never continue to push the policies. We never continue to do the things or the promises that we make inside of these settings. Um, I think the, the things that the students come up with, the ideas that they come up with to support minority students can very easily be 
support it, but we just lose the fire. And I feel like every time something terrible happens and faculty and staff want to let black students know and black faculty and staff members that they're supported, but it's only for a moment. That's what's going to happen in August. Is this fire still going to be here? Are the students still going to feel supported? Like April said, an election year is coming up. Will you guys be there to help the students through those things or just be an arm for them to lean on? I just, I don't know. I feel like even as a faculty member, not as a staff member, now I don't know if anything has changed. I think I had a little bit more hope as an undergraduate student. I don't know. I guess when you're a student, you're a little bit more hopeful and optimistic. But now that I've gotten on the other side, like I feel very, I don't know. I feel very disheartened. Like these conversations are great. And I've been invited to so many of them, but we just lose the fire afterwards. And I just want to encourage everyone to, to be there for the students, but not only that, the, the faculty and staff members that aren't here to encourage them to participate in these conversations, to provide them with the resources as well. And I think that's, that's my piece. All right, thank you, thank you. Mr. Marcus Kirkland. I had to get off mute. Mr. Uh, Mr. Jefferson, thank you. Um, just wanted to give a little bit of a, you know, I think sometimes as black males, we don't, we don't speak up enough. Um, you know, there's a lot of sisters that we let, uh, you know, stand up for us. And uh, I'll probably have a little bit of a unique situation because English is actually my second language as well. Um, and as uh, Dr. Davis said, you know, I was, I had a mom that was a doctor of education and I wasn't tested in elementary school. And then I finally was tested. And uh, when she went to the school and, and raised Cain, and uh, I tested higher than anybody else in my grade. Um, you know, I have a unique, I guess also I have a son that's 19 years old and he's a freshman or now he's a sophomore at Wingate. And, um, you know, I, I said this on a call on last Friday, I, I don't have the luxury of saying hello to my son when he calls me, when he leaves the house. Uh, when my son leaves the house and he calls me, the first thing I say is what's wrong? you okay. I don't, I don't have the luxury of saying hello. Um, you know, every parent fears for getting that phone call, but, um, you know, my son could be driving two minutes down the road to the, to the grocery store and, you know, I could get that phone call because he's 6'2", 260 pounds. Um, you know, it's tough. You know, the first thing they see about us when we walk into a room is that we're, we're big black dudes, you know, I'm 6'4", 300 pounds. So when I walk in a room, you know, I have to make everybody feel comfortable because if I don't, people are gonna be on edge. And one thing that I've always said about bias is, is that when they see me, they don't see that I have a degree. They don't see that I speak a few languages. They don't see that I'm married with two kids. Um, they don't see that I'm a, basketball coach at Wingate University, they see that I'm a big black dude and I'm immediately a threat. And so I've always wondered why it is that I have to make them feel comfortable. I have to have that conversation with my son. Um, as some of the speakers have said earlier, you know, hey, your, your license, need, your wallet needs to be out of your pocket. Um, your, your registration and your insurance card need to be in your visor, in your son visor. Um, when they show up to the car, you roll all your windows down so they can see what's in the, in the back of your car. These are conversations that I have to have with, with my son before he's allowed to leave the house. And, um, you know, before he leaves the house every time I say, I love you because you never know. And, um, you know, that's, but they don't, I'm not made to feel comfortable. We had, we had some incidents on campus and Delisha was involved with this and some, several other students that are here. And we had some meetings with the local police department. And, you know, I explained to them, like, when a police officer walks in the room, I feel differently than probably everybody else in this room that's not of my color. Um, even at 6'4", 300 pounds, you think, oh, he's a big, strong dude. But a police officer walks in the room, I get nervous. If there's a police officer in a grocery store 
and I'm walking by him. I look down to see which side his gun is on and I walk on the other side. So he doesn't think I'm reaching for his gun. This is all stuff that I do subconsciously or consciously, however you want to say it, but it's done. And I always question, why do I have to make him feel comfortable when he should be making me feel comfortable? And, and that's the, you know, until, you know, that training goes into place and it's kind of the same thing in the classroom, you know, as an, as an athlete, um, I was always put into the easiest classes. And again, Dr. Davis, my mom was, sounds similar to yours. She, she wasn't going for that. I bring home a schedule and, you know, immediately uh, she was at the school the next day. Uh, we're going to switch these classes up. And that happened from, and you know, heck, till I graduated from college. My freshman year of college, the basketball coach put me in classes that he thought would be okay. And my mom put me in classes that she thought that she knew were going to be okay. So, <laughs> you know, it wasn't, wasn't no bringing home an easy A. We'll just say it that way. Um, and so, but that's really what I wanted to say from my perspective. I mean, we go through it every day. And the one thing I challenge, um, you know, uh, my colleagues with and the faculty is that, you know, I'm 45. I don't mind saying that. A lot of you haven't been dealing with um, racial issues your entire life. And that's okay. So you're not going to be as good at it, right? Like I'm 45. So I've dealt with this for 45 years. I've been a black male for 45 years. I spent time in Italy and I spent time here. Um, but, you know, you're not going to be as good at it. All I ask you to do is to stick up for us in the rooms that we're not in. Because there's going to be rooms that we're not in. There's going to be meetings that we're not in. And we're going to be talked about in those meetings. And I just ask that at, when, when that happens, that you have our back. Um, and so, you know, even to the students, you're going to be around your circle of friends. You know, don't let stuff slide. We let stuff slide long enough. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, uh, Antonio. Thank you for putting this on. Uh, it's been pretty, pretty been amazing. All right. Thank you so much, Coach. Uh, so now I want to thank you all for um, all of our particip participants for sharing. Um, so we're going to end it now with words from our uh, three presenters. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you again, Antonio, and thank you again um, to the Winget family for allowing me to participate. Um, something came to mind when uh, Marcus was talking, and I, I talked to you a little bit before on the last call about my love for my alma <laughs> And uh, we've been having some conversations you may have seen in the news as well, um, but there's a population that we haven't talked about. Um, we've addressed faculty and staff, we've talked about students in general, but I want to, to end on a note talking about our athletes. And I know Coach Long, I'm going to call you out since we're starting to build this relationship, uh, but I saw Coach Long was on early, I don't know if he's still here. Um, but there's been some conversations and some um, information shared by former Iowa athletes about their, the implicit bias within the athletic department. And I, I venture to, um, to encourage you to have those conversations as well. Sometimes we exclude our athletes because we, we see them getting certain privileges because they play football or play basketball, run track or whatever it may be. Um, but the former athletes talked about how, you know, coaches would kick them out of workouts because their hair was half braided how um, they were told they couldn't wear tank tops because they had too many tattoos and that wasn't our culture at the school. Um, they talked about um, you know, getting, purchasing a new car or their parents getting a new car for them and being questioned about how they got it. So thinking about um, that population as well, I really want to, to push us to also have conversations about the implicit bias that some of our student athletes um, and possibly, I don't know, um, Coach Kirkland, maybe some of our coaches also experience um, within that realm. But I, again, I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. I look forward to, to seeking and hearing more information about how Wingate, as Delicia um, has challenged, continues the conversation and continues to push um, to, to talk about inclusion in a way that is truly um, 
addressing the issues that they have there. And one last note, I'm sorry I'm being long-winded. One last note, I don't know if this conversation has happened since I'm not technically on the campus there, um, but also having a conversation with the Wingate community um, and the university. You have students of color who are not from that area, who may be from out of town. Um, I think Delicia is from Atlanta. So you're coming to, you know, uh, Wingate, North Carolina and experiencing something very different. Um, and it's a, a small town and, uh, you know, they may be walking down to the food line or wherever, but having those conversations, particularly now with everything that's going on with your local police departments, with um, you know the sheriff and things of that nature about understanding that Wingate's diversity is growing, that the student, uh, the Wingate student may not be the stereotype that they think they are and understanding uh, how those students now fit into that community and trying to, to encourage them to not rely on their uh, implicit bias in how they interact with those students. So those are the things that, um, that I want to leave with you and I look forward to hearing more about how Wingate will continue to address the concerns of all students, faculty, and staff, as well as the community. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell. Um, either Dr. Davis or Dr. Monday, either or. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and, and uh, start because I love for Dr. Monday to, to end it, because uh, I, I, like I said, I'm always about learning and growing. I'm going to say exactly what I said uh, the last time we all met, and for those of you that weren't a part of that conversation, I want you to hear me when um, I say that training alone does not fix any of this. Um, these are just tools, you know. Um, this truly is what I call heart work, and that's not my term. This is a term that's common in um, racial equity work, but it is heart work. It is self-work. Um, you know, training does not change people. People change themselves. And so I would truly encourage you uh, to talk with your administration. Uh, this has to be something that uh, the board, um, the president, uh, and everyone uh, alike at the college has to be a part of the equity agenda. And so you can facilitate training, uh, but if you do not have accountability, that's a part of that process. If you have not truly uh, facilitated some type of assessment, some type of institutional capacity assessment, uh, where you are taking a deep dive look at your practices and your policies and your procedures and applying an equity lens to those types of things and really focus on making systemic change. Training ain't going to do a doggone thing. It's just not. What it's going to do is be a one and done, check, out, check the box, receive a certificate, and then we all feel like we did something and we wear this badge of honor. We went through training and then we know better, right? No, you can't because, uh, you know, the coach said, I'm 45, shoot, I'll be 50, brother. And I got 50 years of a lived experience and everybody on this call has their own personal lived experience as well. And so does it help? Is it a tool? Absolutely. But we have got to get to a place where we stop trying to fix a student and we focus on fixing the institution. And so once we get to that point, uh, that's when we can see change truly take place. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Um, so I'll just close with um, something I had been thinking about um, this past week, and that is legacy. Um, you know, growing up, um, I remember watching for the very first time Eyes on the Prize in middle school. And leaving class that day completely shaken because there was an episode focusing on Emmett Till and seeing his body and seeing what hate looked like physically. And I thought, what would I have done if I had lived then, right? And as I got older and I would meet people and have conversations with people, um, especially moving to, to the South who lived through um, the civil rights movement, I'd want them to share their stories with me. And I was riveted by hearing those firsthand accounts. Um, 
to the students who are on this call, you all are living through history. And one day your grandchildren are going to come up to you and say, grandma, grandpa, we're learning about what happened, this movement that started in 2020. Um, and we, you know, we see the footage, we, we watch this documentary that was produced. Um, what did you do, right, during that season? And you don't want to be the person who says nothing. And this, you know, to some extent, to, well, can apply to you um, if you're a faculty and staff here as well. Um, what will you do? What will you have contributed? And it doesn't mean that you went on protest. It doesn't mean that you, you know, uh, uh, you know, gave testimony in Congress. Not all of us are in positions where we'll do those things. But did you intervene in a conversation where a friend was saying something explicitly racist or implicitly racist? And you said, you know what, actually, I think, I think that's wrong, right? This coming year, as you all matriculate back into um, your college courses, I want you to really begin to think about that because as much as I want you to remember everything you learn in sociology and criminal justice and biology and chemistry, I know that what happens and what you do with what's happening now in, in transforming who you are in your worldview, this is something you will carry with you when you are 30, when you are 50, and when your grandchildren are sitting on your knee. Right. Think about the legacy that you want to, to leave behind. Um, for my colleagues, I want to challenge you as I am challenging myself to think about how we engage with people who hold perspectives that are different from our own, who view the world through a different lens because of their different lived experiences, and to challenge you to grow. We grow in our fields, right, as, as faculty members and staff members. We retool, we read books. If this is an area where you're clearly missing information, push yourself to grow and to challenge. You will be better for it. You will be a better professor and a better staff member. Because I can tell you, the students have come to my office and told me things that colleagues have said in the classroom. And it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. And I think, do I go to this person like and say something to them, even though they're not in my department, right? And so really, really interrogate your assumptions um, about that. And to any administration who's on this call or who will watch the recording of this call, if you, you are in a position of power, um, I just want to reiterate um, what Delicia mentioned. Don't let this be a conversation that we have, it's done, and then we have it a year from now or two years from now. This is a part of your legacy as well, right? Will part of your legacy be instituting something practical that has a real lasting impact on the lives of Wingate University students. So they can look back and say, I'm proud of that school. And I'm gonna say something that's a little bit hard. I had a conversation um, for a couple of hours, about a three hour conversation with an alum. And this student told me that they're not going to donate to Wingate University. They were like, I'm not donating because while I was there, I wanted change to take place and I was never taken seriously by administration. This wasn't someone who just thought about these changes in their minds. They actually went to people in positions of, of, of authority and they felt that they weren't taken seriously. And when the student relayed that to me, there's nothing that I could say um, because I understood. And so we don't want our students to feel that way. And so really take this to heart and think about how you can be a part of the process, not only of changing Wingate University, but of making your own legacy um, whatever that might be, one that you look back on and feel feel proud about. So I will end it there. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Monday. Um, thank you to everyone who had the opportunity to share tonight. Um, again, this is only um, the beginning. Uh, this conversation needs to continue going on. And actually, they'll continue next week. So next Wednesday, um, a quick plug, um, Dr. Jesslyn Anderson, she was on. She might have went away. Uh, she'll be leading the discussion next week called The Color of COVID. So she'll be talking about the race, racial disparities in the healthcare system and um, essentially why black and brown folks were um, higher diagnosis of COVID versus um, white individuals. So she'll be breaking down basically racial disparities in healthcare. So um, watch out for information on that. And other than that, thank you all so much. Um, we keep, keep the conversations going and um, have a good evening. If you are here for license credit, please stick around. I'm gonna post the, um, the link into the chat for your credit um, 
right now. All right, thank you all.